And then, and then as the hospital expanded, what you're looking at um, was the Family Health Center, which was the home of our Family Medicine Residency Program, which was established in 1973. And back in 1979 is when the hospital was renamed Broadlands Medical Center instead of just the Polk County Hospital. And again, we continued to expand and it hasn't stopped yet, um, but this was the construction of what we call the Sands Hospital. Um, and it was named after Sydney Sands, who was a longstanding psychiatrist who served at Broadlands. And then um, we built on top of that uh, hospital. So in 19, or excuse me, in 2020, um, amidst the pandemic, we opened a new hospital floor. So we added a 42,000 square foot addition to the hospital and built upwards. Fortunately, the structural footings were in place. And so we didn't get to do a huge opening, but in August of 2020, we did open um, the new hospital floor. And with that, we opened a new birthing center. Um, there are 10 beds in our birthing center. The rooms went from being 170 square feet to 480 square feet. Um, one of the things um, that was most requested um, was a bathtub in the suite. So you can see in the photo that all of the rooms now have bathtubs. Previously, we just had a metal tub that they would fill with water and wheel down the hall if a mom wanted to um, soak in the tub while she was in labor. Um, we do not do water deliveries, um, but we do let moms soak in the tub, and then um, they have access through those barn doors that slide um, that they can get mom back into bed quickly if she needs to get back up and deliver her baby. So I have been at Broadlands for just over seven years. And when I came, we were delivering about 312 babies a year. With this new unit, we're on pace to deliver over 800 babies in this um, current fiscal year, which will end June 30th. Amidst the pandemic, um, we uh, we're in the midst of building this new unit. So what we did was midway through, we made modifications so that all of our ICU rooms have negative airflow and isolation capacity. So this is a photo of one of our six beds that is located within our new ICU unit. And then this is our med surge um, space. And so we added um, new rooms in this new hospital floor and then um, were able in the floor below, which was our existing med surge unit, we were able to make all of our rooms single occupancy, which for all of the reasons you can imagine, um, couldn't be more welcomed by our patients. Um, when you're not feeling well, the last thing you want is a roommate. Um, it minimizes obviously the spread of infection. Uh, it has cultural sensitivity ramifications. Um, you don't have to share a television or a bathroom or anything like that. So we do now have 45 med surge beds and they're all single occupancy rooms. You can kind of see through the window, <clears throat> excuse me, we back up to the river. So we're, we're very fortunate that all of our rooms have beautiful views of nature and um, a very tranquil environment for healing. Another large component of our hospital is we have a robust inpatient behavioral health unit. So back in 2015, our existing inpatient unit was taken down to the studs. Um, the entire unit was renovated and it's a 30 bed unit that has double occupancy rooms. Um, in fiscal year 21, we had over a thousand inpatient admissions. The unit is full 24 seven. Um, but some of the modifications to the new unit included, there's a patient hospitality area. So if a patient wants something to drink or something to eat, they have access to those things around the clock where before they maybe had to ask their nurse for access to those services or amenities. Um, we have now patient activity areas where before there was one general congregating area. Now there's several patient activity areas. So if someone wants to do puzzles or play a game, or if one group wants to watch football and another group wants to watch home, home garden television, there's the opportunity that they can um, go into space and um, do different activities. Um, you know, unlike a traditional hospital, 
room in med, med search where you're in your room 24 seven, you know, in our inpatient behavioral health unit, it's really um, encouraged that they're out and about and mingling. So the, the opportunity to have patient activity areas was really much needed and um, has been very well received. And so the unit that was used during renovations, we went through a permanent wave of renovations and expanded our IBH unit a year later. We added an additional 14 beds. These are single occupancy um, rooms. And really this lower level unit um, is focused on people suffering from major depression. And um, one of the things that they did is they built in ECT treatment suites. Um, so for patients who've been resistant to traditional medication or treatment, um, ECT has proven to be a really effective um, treatment methodology for patients with major depression. Um, and again, you can see this is a four season solarium um, that our patients have access to beautiful views of nature while they're receiving care in our inpatient behavioral health unit. Some additional expansions to our campus in recent years include our medical plaza. So this building was constructed in 2017. The first floor is our family medicine um, clinic. And again, this is where our family medicine residency program is based. Um, also on the first floor of this clinic is our geriatric and memory center. The second floor of this building is our dental clinic. Um, excuse me, it is not our dental clinic, that's on the third floor. It's our outpatient behavioral health clinic. Um, this consolidated all of our mental health um, outpatient services into one building where before they had previously been kind of located throughout our entire campus. Um, so we have a robust outpatient mental health clinic where we see over 60,000 patient visits a year. And then um, our third floor is our dental clinic. Um, we are the largest Medicaid provider of dental care in the state of Iowa. We have three dentists. Um, and then we also are the largest extramural training facility for the University of Iowa's dental program. So we train 40 senior dental students a year with the assistance of adjunct faculty, which is dentists from the Des Moines community who assist in training University of Iowa senior dental students here at Broadlawn. Um, what that does is it allows us to expand our capacity and treat more patients. Um, the demand for oral medicine care is far exceeding what we can possibly meet. So our wait times, unfortunately, right now are quite elongated. Um, the fourth floor of this building is our pain management center. Um, we've got a unique approach to pain management in that we've got a traditional pain management provider alongside two interventional pain management providers. Um, our traditional pain management provider is also cross-trained in acupuncture to provide um, alternative uh, care options for pain. And then we also, our department is run by a psychologist. And so she also does assessments and helps pain, help manage pain with um, pain management methodologies um, through her mental health techniques. We have expanded Broadlands um, with two community clinics. So we have a community clinic that opened in November of 2016, which is our East University Clinic. Um, so it's not too far from the state fairgrounds. Um, it has just um, been overwhelmingly positively received. Um, within that, we have family medicine, urgent care, and a rotation of specialty services. Um, probably the most robust being our ophthalmology and optometry services. Um, we also have mental health physical therapy, midwifery, and women's health. Um, so that has uh, grown exponentially and there's conversations that perhaps we should build upwards and make that a two-story clinic. And then just before the pandemic, we opened the Cityville Clinic. Um, we had a physician align with us um, back probably in, I think it was 2015, Dr. Carol Freer, and her space was no longer going to be available downtown. And so we opened the city of El Clinic kind of to meet the needs of downtown um, patient population, but also South Des Moines. Um, and it has done extremely well. Um, it's a small clinic. It's just about 5,000 square feet and it has urgent care, family medicine, internal medicine, and women's health. Again, just prior to the pandemic, 
um, we completed a remodel of our oncology and hematology center. Uh, Dr. Brad Lair was a provider at Mohai, and he had been volunteering at Broadlawn and discerned that there was really such demand for oncology services that we needed our own uh, clinic. So he joined Broadlawn's, it's probably been close to eight years now, um, and the space that they had inherited was not optimum. So we remodeled um, that unit and made it a much more uh, welcoming and therapeutic environment. Um, so what you're looking at is the chemotherapy uh, treatment suite. Um, so patients can get their infusion therapy and have a little bit more privacy where before they were you know, very closely aligned and um, were within the original hospital building. So um, it addressed a lot of HVAC and windows and um, some of the not so glamorous issues that come with being an older facility. Um, so again, that's a very robust clinic. They're seeing about 750 patient visits um, per month. And that's just Dr. Lair and his nurse practitioner, Julie Shuck. Um, we have been fortunate over the last few years to add a lot of innovative specialists to our practice. Um, in one of the photos here, you're seeing Dr. Sam Jameson. He is an orthopedic physician, and he has brought um, ancillary hip replacement procedures. And most recently, now we've got the Mako robot, which I'm going to get to in a later slide. Um, so um, helping patients who are in need of joint replacement um, have better outcomes and more, more rapid recoveries um, through his innovative techniques. Um, that, that strange um, metal thing that you're seeing in the lower, that is actually a 3D ankle implant. Um, so one of our podiatrists, Dr. Micah Murdoch, um, he does titanium uh, ankle implants um, and has had astounding results with uh, that technology. And then <clears throat> most recently what we're working on, um, when the ICU and the birthing center moved upstairs, the vacated space um, immediately went under construction and we are expanding our surgery department. So the first phase of construction was completed in November. So what you're looking at on this slide is a photo of the new nursing station. And then we added 16 patient pre-op suites. And so within that, that suite, um, the loved ones can sit in there with their family member while they're getting prepped for surgery. They take that bed um, and take the patient in for surgery. And the loved ones are able to just stay in that room throughout the dur duration of the procedure. So the surgeon will come back and let them know, here's how the surgery went. And then after phase one and phase two recovery, the patient returns to that suite. Um, so if it's outpatient, then they would get discharged from that suite. Um, if it's inpatient, then they would get admitted into the hospital. Um, but one of the things, obviously, through the pandemic was um, coming up with ways to minimize where people are sitting in large groups. So our actual surgery waiting room now is quite small um, because loved ones are in this preoperative patient room with, their pa with the patient. These are some photos of the new ORs. Um, we are adding two additional ORs and a new endoscopy suite. So when it's all said and done, we'll have seven operatory suites and one endoscopy suite. Um, like I mentioned previously, we have incorporated the Mako robot for orthopedic surgeries and the Da Vinci robot for ob uh, or urology and general surgeries. And what does that mean? Um, well, really the main um, takeaways from it incorporating robotic surgeries is that it's more, pre more precise, less invasive, less blood loss, uh, a shorter recovery, and better patient outcomes. Um, we've had just, you know, wonderful results so far. Um, there are conversations that um, joint replacement surgeries may be done on an outpatient basis going forward because the recoveries are so much quicker. Another key component of Broadlands is that we are a medical education campus. So we have a family medicine residency program where we have 28 residents training. We have four transitional year uh, residents who are doing their first year of training before they go on into specialties. And then we also have a jointly administered psychiatric residency program that we partner with Unity Point Des Moines. One of the things that's unique about Broadlands Family Medicine Residency Program is that we really are training our physicians to go out uh, and practice in rural communities. So about three quarters of our 
providers choose to stay in Iowa, um, and some of these statistics are here on the slide, um, we have 173 of our residents currently practicing still in Iowa, and 95 of those are practicing in rural communities of 30,000 individuals or less. Um, so by training within our hospital, they're getting you know, a, a very robust overall um, understanding of what it takes to be the emergency doctor, the pediatric doctor, the OBGYN, because when they're in these smaller communities, they're a one-shop medical practice. And so um, to get exposed to a lot of acuities um, by being a provider at Broadlands, and um, we take a lot of pride in the fact that they are choosing to stay in Iowa, most specifically choosing to practice in rural communities. One of the unique programs that we have is the Teach Tech program. And so it's training and educating for a career in healthcare. And this is a, a program that was launched, um, it was piloted in November of 2016, and it was loosely modeled after a project um, that took place at Johns Hopkins. Um, and so at Johns Hopkins, they were taking people from the community and giving them jobs as dishwashers or laundering. Um, but Broadlands decided to take it a step further and um, make it a job, job training program, um, taking people from our um, neighboring communities of 50314 and not just giving them jobs, but giving them training so that they could have a career in healthcare. So in, the, in this program, they get basically an overview of different career opportunities that exist in a hospital setting but they concurrently are earning their basic and advanced CNA certification. So we are partnering with DMAC. They do the certification and we train up to 10 students at a time. Um, but then also as far as recruiting the participants, because we're trying to, to really lift up the people in our community <clears throat> in the North Des Moines neighborhood, um, we work with a, a nonprofit called Urban Dreams as far as identifying candidates um, who might be good fit for our program. Um, and then we also have a school-based um, initiative. So that's the tech program. So the training and educating for adults is the TEACH program and the training and educating without that A um, is our student program. So we've worked closely with Des Moines Public Schools and with IJAG to identify students um, that might be, have an interest in pursuing a career in healthcare. What we've really found is that, you know, this has been eye-opening for a lot of these individuals, you know, things like they didn't realize how important it was to have, have benefits and health insurance. Um, we give them soft skill training on professionalism and work with them um, to understand how important it is to show up on time, to show up, you know, in your scrubs and ready to work. And these are paid job training initiatives um, because these are individuals who have maybe historically faced barriers to, um, career opportunities in the past, we want to make sure that, you know, we are helping them um, with career opportunities, with educational opportunities, um, and addressing some of the social determinants of health. And you can see so far, we've got 127 graduates and 49 individuals still employed at Broadlands. Um, but that doesn't mean that these people that aren't still at Broadlands aren't out in the community these skills once they've got their CNA certification applied to working in nursing homes or other hospital facilities throughout the community. So um, I know there's a lot of connectivity with the people who've participated in the program. The gentleman at the far right of your screen, his name is Dennis Henderson. I mean, he, he basically adopts these individuals and, you know, keeps in touch with all of them. Um, and it's just been a really rewarding um, meaningful initiative for our hospital. There's a lot of pride in our, with throughout our staff as uh, these individuals graduate from the program and become full-time employees at Broadlands. Another community engagement uh, initiative that we've been involved with has been um, throughout the pandemic, we've partnered really closely with United Way of Central Iowa. Really early into the pandemic, we realized um, that there was a lot of disparity in who was getting COVID, who had access to testing, um, who had access to PPE. Um, so we worked very closely with United Way of Central Iowa in an initiative called Win for All. Um, and with that, we made sure that through um, kind of a grassroots effort, um, we were working with nonprofits and the shelter and 
um, other community organizations to make sure that people had access to masks, to hand sanitizer, to good educational information. Um, and then as the pandemic um, progressed and um, we developed you know, access to the vaccine, we worked with United Way um, knowing that there was some hesitation um, from marginalized individuals about receiving the vaccine. Um, we tried to come up with ways that we could encourage um, people to get vaccinated. So what we did is we worked with Corinthian Baptist Church here in Des Moines, and we held a series of vaccination clinics that were really directed at minorities and made them feel safe getting a vaccination in a place that was familiar and comfortable to them. Um, so we were able to successfully vaccinate in the first vaccination clinic over 1,100 individuals, 65% of whom identified as people of color. And we were able to get 95% of those individuals back for their second dose. Um, and then in October, when the third dose became available, those that were eligible, I think we had over 600 people come back for, for the third um, dose of the vaccine. Um, so that was a really successful collaboration. And we really relied on United Way and their established relationships um, and outreach in the community, as well as their volunteers, um, to help us make that happen. Um, and then, of course, working with Corinthian Baptist Church and the other pastors of local churches, um, that seemed to be a really good pathway for partnership. Um, so that's something that we certainly hope to build upon as it was successful um, in the pandemic. Another initiative that we've worked on um, in recent months is the Prescription Produce Program. And so Broadlands was approached um, to partner with the Iowa Healthy Estate Initiative on this Prescription Produce Initiative and um, was able to provide vouchers to qualified patients who um, are part of Dr. Danley, who's in our Family Health Center. She has a diabetic program. And so the individuals that participated in the program were given vouchers um, that worked at local grocery stores and at the farmer's market and that they could redeem for healthy produce. Um, we saw incredibly successful results in lowering people's A1C levels through this initiative. So successful, in fact, that um, Iowa Healthy Estate Initiative was awarded the medium-sized um, United States Mayor's Grant. So they have now got $175,000 in additional funding that we're going to be expanding this pilot program um, so that we can provide healthy produce vouchers for pediatric patients as well. Um, so seeing the success of programs like this is something that, you know, we've all been so focused on the pandemic, but getting back to, you know, trying to address some of these underlying, underlying concerns that are compromising people's health, which is access to healthy foods. Um, we are definitely exploring ways that we can expand our partnership with organizations like Food Bank of Iowa and DMARC um, to try and ensure that our patients who, you know, perhaps don't have the ability to um, purchase produce because it's so costly um, to find ways that we can get that provided for them. And so um, we are in the midst actually right now of developing a new strategic plan. We have a new CEO, Tony Coleman, who started in December of 2021. Um, but our current vision um, is that we are striving to be the best community hospital in the United States. And we think that we are positioned to do just that. Um, we have a bold vision and we're definitely cultivating an environment where, you know, we are striving to provide exceptional health care and assist the marginalized individuals in our community um, so that they have access to the resources they need to take care of their health. And with that, I'm done with my presentation. And I apologize that you had to listen to my froggy voice for the last half an hour, but I am open to any questions that any of you may have. Well, thanks, Kate. That was that was really exciting. I I learned a whole lot, and I live here in Polk County, and I am especially excited about the Healthy Produce Project for Pediatrics because, um, as you had alluded to in regards to the social determinants of health, we need to get our little ones to get that base of healthy eating at a younger and younger age, and so that's 
to me, that's really exciting. Because I do have a question, because you are the, um, the county hospital here in Polk County, we have a very diverse population here in Polk County. So can you talk to us a little bit about some of the translation services and other cultural specific services that um, you provide for um, the multitude of diverse populations that we have here in Polk County? You bet, that is a great question and I should have had a slide on that. We have 10 interpreters on staff. Um, so those are the most popular languages that we see. Um, so we have Spanish, we have Bosnian, we actually just asked, excuse me, added two Afghani um, interpreters as well. Um, but we also have video and language lines with access to over 250 languages. So we serve the largest refugee pop population in the state of Iowa. Oftentimes the first time that a new language is presented in Iowa, it's at Broadlawn. Um, so it's something that is really important to our staff is that we try to be welcoming and inclusive to everyone who walks through our door and meet them where they're at. Um, our interpreters, I mean, they're just a lifeline of our hospital. And of course we work very closely with Embark and different uh, refugee services of Iowa, um, LCI. And we, we try and uh, address so many needs for individuals who maybe have just arrived in our country. So our case management services um, is a large component of our care delivery as well. Um, making sure people have access to housing, making sure they have access to clothing. Um, we have you know, a group of six men who are living in one apartment and between the six men, they had one pair of shoes. Um, so we have a clothing closet to make sure that people when they're discharged from the hospital have access to you know, a pair of slacks or a sweatshirt or underpants, um, socks, shoes. Um, so that's something that our foundation actively fundraises for so that we can try and meet the needs of our patients so that they're discharged um, with the things that they need. Um, also building upon that, um, we have a lot of refugees who come and they deliver babies and they don't have access to a car seat or a safe sleeping environment. So we discharge a lot of our new moms with a car seat and a playpen so that they have a safe uh, transport home and a safe sleeping environment for when they get home with their baby. That's great. Those are all wonderful resources that um, individuals that um, have more income sometimes forget about those important things. So we do have a question in the chat box. Um, so, um, it says that they love, love, love the teach and the tech program. Any talk about expansion of that program with potential with pharmacy technicians? Um, we are in conversations and I see your last name is Pritzborn. I went to high school with a Jennifer Pritzborn, so I'm not sure if you're related, um, but I know she's a pharmacist. Um, we are in conversations about expanding our teach tech program, both with DMAC and with Des Moines Public Schools. Um, I know for sure um, pharmacy technicians, lobotomists, um, there are definitely other areas that we need um, additional workforce. So um, we have a new um, vice president of human resources and she will also be our chief diversity equity and inclusion officer. Her name is Renee Hardman and she is starting June 6th. So um, conversations are in place, but I think things will really start to happen once she um, takes her role within the organization. Excellent. And Renee is a firecracker and has lots of energy and lots of enthusiasm and is truly a champion um, for um, all individuals. So it's you got a good one with Renee there um, serving at Broadlawns. Um, so thank you for that. Um, Kate, can you just expand a little bit? Um, because I know for many of us near and dear to our heart are our rural community hospitals. Can you talk to us a little bit about that program and, and how you really advocate for the residents to continue to stay in Iowa and to continue to transfer their skills and knowledge to some of those rural hospitals for us. Sure, so Dr. Larry Seaver is the Director of Medical Education for Roblons. Um, he practiced in rural Iowa for many, many years. So it's really part of the the recruitment process is they're interviewing residents is they, you know, they really want to identify 
residents who are looking to stay in Iowa and practice medicine, um, they just they take a lot of pride in getting them a very well-rounded education, uh, you know, access to all of the things they would need to set up, a, you know, maybe one person medical clinic in these small towns. Um, I also know that a lot of the smaller communities, like say they have a physician who's retiring, they may work really closely with our residency program to try and identify a student who might be interested in establishing practice when they graduate. You know, and it's something also, <clears throat> I, for a while, government relations was under my umbrella. Um, one of the things that we also talked about was loan forgiveness incentives um, for medical residents if they agree to establish practice in rural communities that they would receive some incentives for um, debt forgiveness. Because even if they commit to five years in that period of time, maybe they've established um, a strong following in the community. Maybe they've, you know, had children and had kids in school. Once they've been there at least five years, they probably are likely to stay. Um, so we've worked closely with the state trying to come up with ways to incentivize people um, to to think outside of the box as to how they can attract uh, physicians um, to establish practice in smaller communities. Sorry, that wasn't the most succinct answer. No, that was great. Um, so Kate, as the chief strategy officer and you, you were there during COVID, what was one of the bigger challenges that Broadlawns had to not feel isolated, um, but feel part of that community through all the chaos um, of COVID, especially early on in the pandemic? Hmm. You know, I think, um, as strange as it may sound, I feel like during the pandemic, and in and, and my umbrella is marketing, public relations, foundation, government relations, and now strategy. Um, so because there was so much media scrutiny, um, of healthcare organizations during the pandemic, I feel like it gave Broadlands a place at the table. So we worked closely with Mercy One and Unity Point and Polk County Health Department and Iowa Department of Public Health and Primary Care and Iowa Clinic and all the other you know healthcare entities to get messaging out to the community. And I I feel like that the silver lining of the pandemic is. I think, and I don't know what other people's perspectives may be, I feel like the county hospital found a place at the table with these other big system hospitals in providing information, providing access to resources, because if Mercy One didn't have enough testing supplies, guess what? We gave them some. If Unity Point didn't have as many masks as we did, we gave them some. So there was a lot of reciprocity and I think what it illustrated is there is a need and a purpose for every healthcare system and every healthcare facility in our community. I love that because it takes all of us to uplift and empower our community. And we all have special skills and talents to bring to the table, um, regardless of how big or small you are. So that is a very heartwarming um, answer, Kate. And I love that. And yeah, it's, it's, it's great stuff. I would encourage others to put any questions that you have in the chat so you don't necessarily have to listen to me the entire time. Um, and I do appreciate that since Kate has not been feeling well that she's she's hanging on. She's a trooper um, <laughs> and um, you know, COVID stinks overall. So yeah, so we'll give it a couple minutes to see if anybody else has anything else to add in, in the chat. Um, but I think that Kate, you know, one of the statements that you made that's really powerful is the work that you do at Broadlands and the work that everyone does in public health is to lift people up in the community. And we all have different gifts and different talents on how we do that. And so, you know, embracing those gifts and talents and we don't have to look like someone else right next door to us. And so that's that's the gift and the beauty of working at Broadlands. And it's also the gift and the beauty at working in public health because we know what's most important for our communities and we strive to meet those needs of our community. So 
We do have a question, Kate. How did you figure out what was needed in the community? I am, so is, so how did you figure out the needs that you needed in the community? As far as COVID, um, I think we, we saw that there was a trend um, that minority populations were more frequently um, being diagnosed with COVID than um, others. Uh, so making sure that people of color had access to masks and hand sanitizer became a priority for us because there was a disproportionate number um, of minorities who were being positively impacted by COVID. Um, you know, as far as other healthcare needs, um, we, can, we can track or we do track um, where our patients are coming from. So like when we expanded to our East University Clinic, it was very clear to us that the Eastern Corridor of Polk County um, was not adequately served as far as their medical needs because we were seeing so many of them at our North Des Moines Hospital. Um, <clears throat> and and it, it was an accurate assessment because we've just seen tremendous volumes at that East University Clinic. And, and we anticipated that when we built it. So we put the structural footings in place to build upwards. Um, so now it's just a matter of, of determining when we would move forward with expanding that clinic. Um, I didn't put this in a slide, but um, we are about ready to break ground on a clinic at Drake. Um, so we, a couple of years ago, um, entered into an agreement with Drake to take over responsibility for administering student health and student counseling services. Um, but part of those conversations with Drake that go backwards to now five years is that they really wanted a clinic because um, the Drake Neighborhood Association um, had approached them and said that they were really concerned that there wasn't access to health care in that neighborhood. So we are going to build a clinic um, for those of you who have been to the Drake campus. Um, it's right next to the Walgreens. Um, so there will be a family medicine and urgent care clinic with a rotation of specialties, kind of similar to what we've done in East Des Moines and downtown. Um, but in addition to that, we'll embed Drake Student Health and Student Counseling um, into that clinic. So we're going to break ground on that next month, and it will um, hopefully be open for business by the school year in 2023. Wow, that's exciting. Thanks so much, Kate, for, for explaining all that. Um, and I know that the City View Clinic that you have is not too far from the IPHA's office. So, you know, when the weather's nice and it's not 100 degrees out, we can walk down the street and, and see how that is being utilized. So that's, that's really nice to have that here in downtown Des Moines. So Kate, I know that, you, you know, we've got some going on. Um, we have Haley. Haley was our intern from Drake. So Haley's pretty excited um, that you all will be joining Drake in that area. Um, so it's pretty exciting. So with that being said, we're going to wrap it up and we're going to give you back some time. But I want to thank Kate uh, so much for sharing all the growth um, and the impact that Broadlawn has on the community here in Polk County um, and their gifts and their talents that they share with us to keep us health, healthy and, and safe and flourishing. Um, and I wanna thank all of you who have given up your lunch uh, time to learn this wonderful knowledge and share this time of camaraderie with us. Um, next month is our last Lunch and Learn for the season, and then we will take um, July and August off, and um, we will be learning about some doula services. Um, if you have some ideas for some Lunch and Learns, we're still working on next year's calendar, so give me a shout out. It's Sharon at iowapha.org or email Brett, and we'll work on that schedule, um, so we're pretty excited about that, and as always, um, IPHA appreciates your membership because um, your dues and the sustaining donors help support our mission. Um, so if you are a member, thank you. Um, if you attended the public health conference a couple weeks ago, it was nice to see a lot of you for the first time instead of in these Zoom boxes, um, but it's also nice to reconnect with you. Um, and if you're not a member, please just consider um, joining IPHA. We're good people. Um, and students, 
If you're a student, check with your department chair, as I know that some students um, have the opportunity through their university to have their dues supported. So um, all of these Lunch and Learns have been recorded. They'll be uploaded on the IPHA YouTube channel. Um, it'll be a couple of weeks before this current one will be uploaded, um, but you'll find all of our webinars and anything that you missed there. So Kate, again, thank you for sharing your wisdom and all the exciting work with Broadlawns. And thank you everyone for enjoying your lunch with us and take care, um, enjoy the nice weather and hopefully we'll see you all next month. Have a great day, folks.